Well, welcome back to episode three of, of recreating Notion on Rails with, uh, where we're gonna be using TipTap. This is perhaps the most exciting episode. We're gonna play with a new JavaScript based headless editor, which is a demonstrated right here. We're gonna be taking the editor part, we're gonna put it inside the app in here, and look, it's gonna be very exciting. My name is Dr. Nick Williams from Mokra, and uh, welcome to our series on uh, recreating the Notion app that we love in Ruby on Rails, and thanks for joining me. To catch up from where we got to, uh, we've got the adding, and then over here I've got a uh, little plus and minus buttons, minus does delete, plus doesn't, doesn't, doesn't do much, you can see it's created a new page, it doesn't show up here, I haven't uh, bothered to do this yet, the tree structure, obviously we'll, we'll want that soon, but until, until I can start to put pages and link them off a page content, I don't really you know, need that yet, so we'll get back to it. But uh, nonetheless, this page is a child, I guess. But uh, so we've got new pages at the top level, we've got our titles, and we've got deleting. Just wanted to show you something that when I started playing Jumpstart, I thought this helper was really useful. I didn't know much about SVGs a couple years ago. I thought they were a lot like images. You know, you put them in a file, you'd load them up, and they work somehow. They, they look XML. -y. So there's this little helper. And then when I started watching uh, Tailwind tutorials with Adam Weatherman, in fact, me sharing with you is somewhat inspired by his videos from, from a few years ago before he sort of created the Tailwind company and made pretty videos. He used to do these long um, videos that I used to watch and I learned a lot from that. And I learned from him that SVGs could just be inline, which I guess made sense. You know, it's this HTML and you just throw them in there. You watch a lot of Tailwind, you'll see a lot of inline uh, SVGs. So then there's a question, do you continue inlining SVGs or put them in files? And I've come to the thinking that it, the better off putting them in files or giving them a name and now this to me is a lot more readable. Like what is this image? Well, it's an ad with an outline. Whereas I look at this and it doesn't tell me anything about what it is. So I've gone down the path of using these files. So now what file do we got? What's this helper? Over here, this is in Jumpstart, but I'll show you where, the, the, where this comes from. A little helper that wraps around this other helper, which comes from the live. Found it here before I start the video. It's called uh, Inline SVG, and it, lo lots, of, lots of attributes that you might use, but the principle is it pulls a file out from ESB or your asset tree and injects it, uh, mutates it slightly, and then injects it into your DOM. By the time the user gets it, it's in line, but we get to think of it as a named um, file. Uh, where is this file? Somewhere we have. So when you get Jumpstart, you get a bunch of files um, that you can use. You do not have to use them at all, but they are documented here, the, uh, the icons, Zond icon. And of course you can go and get, there's SVGs everywhere. And what I'm saying, is I, I, even if I find a random SVG, I will still put it into a, a file uh, and use the render SVG um, command to bring it in. So then you can pass in some styles, the sizing that you want. There is also the uh, icon XS helpers that uh, Jumpstart has. So they're just slightly different sizes than I was looking for. Actually, let's have a look where they are. So what do we got? So they got sort of specific sizes. So maybe I want small. There we go. So let's change that to icon small, icon small, and there we go. So we've got that. We've got uh, new, we've got delete. Now we're going to rip all this out and see if we can get TipTap to work. I'll just go through why I think TipTap's going to be interesting to us. It's got all the things, you know, even checkboxes, bars. So it's got some nice things. Let me start by saying this. TipTap is inside this box. This is confusing on the documentation because all of the editors look the same, but the tip tap as we know it, is the thing inside the box. Everything outside is this website's layout and rendering and all the, they could have put, they could have put these buttons down the side over here. If we look at all these things, um, because they've just put some buttons in there and they've wired them up with their JavaScript. So this is the tip tap. So what can we do? We can uh, head a one, you know, so they've linked up buttons and essentially that button is calling something on the editor object to say this block 
is a header and we can switch them around. But cool, they've also supported some of the, uh, the markdown syntax that we know. So you can't just use markdown, but you can use some of the syntax. So I can do dot and item two. I could, you know, do one. And kind of cool, you've actually also got checkboxes to do one and you can check them. And it's all, you know, nice, clean HTML underneath. So here is that to-do list, task list. This one here is, is got, here is the label, which is not a label so much as is a wrapper around the, the input. Super interesting. Now, what else, sorry, before we, we move on to other things about tip. So this is code blocks, but I, I think, you know, we could do. So uh, it, it does know that it's Ruby. If I go and look at it, I haven't investigated this yet. I just sort of, so it says a pre-block inside is a code block and it does say language Ruby, but you know, it's not pretty anyway. Maybe there's an extension and we'll get to extensions. What else do we have? We've got some sort of block quote and a horizontal bar. And the only reason I'm clicking these is because they're presented, but there's also hotkeys. So these are, you'd have to wire these up, but TipTap does provide some hotkeys as well. So command B, and you can see that's also wired up there and italic and even, ooh, that's cool. So code, it can highlight. You can sort of see there's these two concepts of a, of a block. This thing is a block and this thing is a block. Inside is some sort of internal changes and I think they're called marks. So this is tip tap. Now you notice that in a tip tap, the presentation here is so you can see that it's got a multi, multi user. Now I'm going to try to put this in another, uh, see if we get the same room. Uh, but we may not. Hooray, we got the same room. So here I am. So there's Elton John. If we go back to my other tab, you can see I was Elton John. If I change my name to Dr. Nick, then over here it says Dr. Nick. So TipTap itself doesn't do collaboration, but one of the things that's interesting about it is it sits on top of some technology uh, called Y.js, which does uh, facilitates a lot of the collaboration. Super hard problem um, to understand and one I don't want to solve. YJS is actually supported by a bunch of different editors. So uh, once we learn more about that, uh, maybe maybe you've got other options. But um, so nonetheless, we're sitting on a technology stack, which is uh, quite exciting. But it's not yet in our Notion app. So let's figure out how we're going to do that. In fact, let's... All right, what have we got? Vanilla JavaScript. What does it take to get it? It just takes some JavaScript. Now, we will put this inside a stimulus controller because that's, uh, you know, that way it'll attach it. We want this to run once the, the JavaScript is loaded and that's what stimulus is good for. Um, and perhaps we can attach the controller to that element. Yeah, so there's an element, but you know, we'll figure it out. All right, so once we install this stuff. A little bit of NBM coffee. Many, many things got in. So for mine, we, we're in this thing called Starter Kit. And Starter Kit is, everything's an extension. I mean, everything's an extension. From the top level document to making something bold. So rather than have you figure out all the different things you might want, they've kind of got this Starter Kit. So those are different things that we're gonna want. Figure out what else we need. Once we get there. Okie dokie. So now we need uh, some DOM and time to get busy. All right. What else can we do? In the header, how do I, the body, yes, the body, but the body. I don't want any of this. Kind of my text is in here. How about we rip that out? So this was kind of where I was doing it with data. Control, let's call it tip tap, hey? Out of there. So we're going to mount that on there and we'll run it. On that object that sounds pretty good something else i want to do page no head comments show let's get rid of the comments for now what do we got now all right comments are gone and the body is dip because you know uh, now i need a controller so we'll, we'll go to the editable controller and sort of copy and paste that tip tap I say that probably then will need it, but uh, nonetheless, connect. So we're just going to this DOM element here. We'll, we'll, to, we'll try that. So where's that code we borrowed? So I need this 
here, and I need that there. And I guess we'll put that in a variable for later. All right, let's see what we got. And maybe because we have a new file, we'll restart. I win the computer games. Look at that. Now, the static content came from here and that's not very interesting. So we need to style it. We need to store it and we need to figure out anything that's wrong. Now, I, I played around when I was looking at the front. If I look at, you can sort of get the gist of the HTML. It's real simple, right? What's interesting is that the line items, well, that's a checkbox. When you look at line sort of lists, lists are list items and then they're P's in size. That was interesting. So I, I made one over here to play with. So this is, is just sort of a simplified set of DOM um, and I tried to play around with styling it. So rather than putting the, the styles in line like you do with you know, the pro Tailwind, I sort of put them over here. And what I noticed before I started was you get this top level pros mirror class. Probably you can configure it, but so I've, I've done the same thing. I've got dot pros mirror and yeah. So let's do that. Let's just borrow this content and we'll make that our Make that our starting point play around okay so that is ugly and it's missing things we don't have that's not a link and we're missing our image and that's all wrong okay well hang on first sorry let's copy the CSS across now it is tailwind CSS so I need to put it in a style sheet somewhere sidebar CSS oh I did make an editor CSS for the, uh, the inline title I moved that there so let's just copy this here So let's try to figure out why this is not a link. Um, if it's not a link, what is it? It's just a block, a P block, paragraph, but I don't want it to be a paragraph. I had it as a paragraph with a link inside. Let's just change these two things to different. Make that inside tab, which, what do we end up with? We end up with just the content, so kidoki. So why does it not like? Maybe what it's doing is it's removing DOM elements it doesn't know about. Uh, why it doesn't know about it? Uh, a link, I don't know, but we'll, we'll get there. So what else doesn't it know? What, what if I add, what if I change this to, oh, I'm scared. Let's just make up a new DOM element. So that, save, probably should save. I changed that to a P. So a thing that it didn't know about changed it to a P and it got rid of this one. And if I put strong here, it kept the strong because it knows about strong. I guess strong matches to the bold extension. All right, well, that's, that's all lovely. Let's figure out how to get links. All right, let's find, ooh, what's it know about link? Link links, related link links. Link. All right, this page. Link is an extension that adds support for a tags. Okay, I guess let's add that. What's next? Then we gotcha. All right, well, that's what that means for my understanding. Let's get rid of all this. Don't need you, don't need you, I need you. So we add it here, and we're going to need to uh, import link from. That was a pretty poor I guess it was extension link. Extension link. So 
that's that, that's that. And now go back here and boom! Look at that, now it's a link. What's that give us? So there it is, so now it knows that my, so so we can see, see it's, it's still a block, but inside the, the this is Raptor, and there's my alternate href, and we've got these other tags for free. So now if I click on it, it'll go to a new page because um, of target blank, which I didn't put there, but it did it itself, and these other attributes. So, I should probably make this back to Google. And well, what else? If I put in alt equals Google it, what's that? So I get, no, don't get the alt. All right, let's find out how this works. Where is my link? All right, so link. So what have we got? We've got settings. So this is how we can configure each of these. So you can just put them in like that, but you can also pass in configure and we could auto link or we can turn open on click off. So let's do that false. I just don't have a reason to do it except to see that how it works. So now if I click it, it doesn't go anywhere. And I guess that's all done with JavaScript. Because that's certainly not how links work. Okay, so we've turned that off. I want that back. And now that clicking works again. So there, there we go. So we can configure any of these extensions with dot configure. Um, but what else does it do? Link on paste, HTML attributes. Now, when I put the mouse over, it doesn't, doesn't get the cursor that I want because I guess it's, I don't know, because it's in an editable thing, but we, let's, what do I got? Actually, how about this? Can I do cursor pointer, which is a tailwind? Hey, look at that. Now I win, so I could I could do that. I kind of, oh, I might put that back in my editor CSS. Sort of that would be for everything. Cursor pointer. That'd be all A. So, you know, so these are classes that I'm applying by CSS, and this is classes being added programmatically. Pros and cons, I guess. But anyway, there we go. So now we got that looks like a pointer. I mean, I could, yeah. I mean, you can do all sorts of things, maybe. Uh, but why? How does how does copy and paste work? So if I I copy that and paste that in, that works. And if I do HTTP Google, and it automatically figures out that it's a link. So that's super interesting. Let's kind of look at the source code, which is. Yeah, I, I think reading the source code is going to help us to understand what the hell is going on. So we've got the link and some a library. What have we got here? Some things coming from the library. Fine from this other library. Okie dokie. These would be those. Oh, okay. So this is the options that we were passing in. So this is where I was passing in uh, class and there, there's extra ones. There you go. So I could actually change target to something else here. Target. Bar. And where's my target? So did change squat, I guess. Okay, so there's some some have some oh okay, that's sorry. So I can put that target in foobar. And now it changed to foobar. Okay, so that's where that comes from. Excellent, and attributes, and here, parse HTML. So this must be something to do with how it figures out that if I, when it's receiving HTML from here, how, whether it figures out that this is an H or not parse. So is it, uh, it's got an href, but it's not an href starting with JavaScript. So I guess if I put JavaScript here, it would, not fine. There you go. So because I put JavaScript at the front here, it's stopped picking the, the, the link extension stopped owning it and saying, this is mine. And therefore no extension picked it up and therefore it got stripped. Okay. And then render HTML, this link, once it's been recognized, the link, this link is represented you know, inside the editor as a, as a data structure. And then how does it spit it back out whenever we want to render the uh, the editor? 
So there, merge the attributes. Okie dokie. Some commands that I think I've passed through and sort of flattened out so I can access link commands without having to know that it's a link or where to find them. Paste rules. So when you paste things into the editor, how to detect or process or something. And then what else? But this was interesting. So find, what is this? So this, link is finding plain text, links and plain text. Oh, okay. So this is the actual muscle of the extension. So the extension is a wrapper around this linkified, which converts things into, does the finding and looks like, so it's email addresses, can go away, yes. Um, so email addresses, there we go. So that's all from linkified and some hashtag and other plugins. Well, that looks, that should be fun. Okay. The other thing we're missing is my image. I had an image. I put an image here and it's gone. So what did I get instead? So we've got the block quote and the good right question. So there's the block quote. So we just ripped this out entirely. What if this was a P? So there's my P with something a break of some sort. And what if I just had image? Then it gets ripped out altogether. Okay, so I assume it's the same. We need, we need an extension. So we've got a page on images. That's this example. So okay, examples. So we love to do more with images, resizing, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Cool. All right, so this there's I've got some content some some things about images but they're, they're continuing to work. And I guess uh, those people paying money to the TipTap team are helping to, to make this all better. But there was more, there was more. I saw more image, image. That's a, that was a demo. This is the extension. Use this extension to render image tags. Very good. So we'll add that. And then we, same as before, we just, bring that in i'll put it here before import image from tip tap tap image okay images i mean you know i guess images work in browser so now my image is there it's got a couple of extra tags a content editable false and draggable draggable true draggable Ooh, ooh, that's handy. I want more of that draggable business. I want everything to be draggable. Excellent. Okay. So what have we got? Some fields about to land by 64, custom classes like before, inline. Let's not worry about that. And source code. Source, source, what have we got? That's so not readable. Something about it. bang parsing. So if if it finds an image with a source key, then it's good. If it finds an image with a source key that's data, maybe good. So it looks like if you try to pass those in, but you haven't set that field, it will just throw it away. This is how we make if we've got this in our data model, how we spit it back out of HTML. Okay. So whilst it doesn't support a bunch of features we want, we have a starting point. Interesting. Very interesting. Now, what, well, here's an idea. What, I mean, if I wanted to do other things, what are my options? Let's, let's move this image up to the top. So it's always, there it is. All right, so now let's see if we can integrate this thing with, you know, stimulus, what that takes. So if I put data, so if I wanted to sort of uh, integrate this or do a mouse over or something, I'd do an action. So mouse over to the tip tap controller and we'll say mouse over image. I have, have doubts. Uh, events low, but that strips out. 
Okay, so we put the attribute there, it gets stripped out. So the way we get, so how about here, configure HTML attributes. About there, it didn't do anything. Oh, it did stuff. Look at us. Look at us. We've attached things to elements. So this is how I get extra DOM attributes on all my images. And as it happens, this then gets linked up into stimulus. Stimulus then accepts this on mouse over JavaScript DOM event that's natural to all of all browsers. And then it calls back into the stimulus JS land, which is this controller and calls this down here. So let's do the same thing for links. Mouse over link. Hmm. Okay, so we we can render the, the contents nicely. We figured out how to make images show up if, if we are in the content. Um, we figured out how to make links show up, uh, bold, etc. We've got all the hotkeys that come for free. We don't yet have any buttons. Maybe we want buttons. Maybe we want them to be mouse overs, flyovers and things, bubble menus and things. So we'll I'll do that another time. But I want to get the content saved. I want to save some content to the database that I have rather than using the static content for every page. Look at that, it's kind of, kind of surreal to have every page the same content. So we need to get the content back out. We need to, to wire up a hook so that when we stop typing, it captures the content, sends it off to the server and doesn't lose my focus. So I've got to make sure I keep this cursor. So if I was to type this saved, I, I want it to save and I don't want it to lose my cursor. Hmm. Hmm. I think that's what we want. So how to do that? Let's go back to tip tap. All right. Con content. No output. Output. Okie dokie. So we've got options. Oh, look at that. Options. I love options. And I guess it comes down to how we want to save this thing. But I think historically, you know, as Rails apps, we save things as HTML. So, so it looks like the data model of, of TipTab is stored in JSON or at least accessible. I wrote this and this. Okay, so that structure that looks nice and is presented as HTML is probably stored internally as something, a hierarchical data structure. So I've, I've made that bold. And therefore the word bold is, is sort of nested and has this mark concept because I could probably also make it italic. So therefore this, their text is bold and italic. And so I guess I can export that, save it and I assume put it back in as well. Now HTML, probably what we'll do until we have a reason not to. So I can get the HTML out and save it and then put it back in um, or set it. I guess that replaces all the content. And YJS is actually something I'm pretty excited about. This is where we're gonna stream. I've been doing a little bit of reading. We're gonna be able to stream all the changes, the micro changes out to all the other browsers and should be able to save whilst doing that. So that's super exciting, but no markdown. We, we saw that we can type you know, the little helpers like hash and, and other sort of markdown syntax, but there's no way to export. Or you could probably make an export it doesn't support importing. Okie dokie, how do we listen for changes? Oh, look, look at us. Look, we're just gonna steal that. I love a good bit of documentation, lets me steal things. Okay, so there's an update. I don't want that one, I want get HTML. Const HTML, and we will log. So anytime it updates, we'll get that spat out. Let's look at the old logs. Hi. Okay, actually tell you what, let's re remove that hi there. And imagine if we sent all this to the server. Debounce to the rescue. Yes, I think we should just go and steal that debounce thing. 
from editable. So we'll take a bit of that. And we'll take this idea. So we'll do on editable and it say 500. There we go. Hi there. I am writing. Nice. All right. So we have to bounce. So now we'll get chunks of change. Well, we, we still get all of the change. You know, we don't get, sorry, we get told about it in chunks now. Now I actually not a big fan of, of this being in line. So we'll say this dot on update. And we'll go down here and we'll go on update and then we'll pass in that let's just give that check that that still works yes it works okie dokie uh, this syntax here so you sort of see they're similar but different binding syntax i don't know why i'm going to try and explain it to you i don't think i truly understand um, but this is like binds binds the method to the object so that you can then when you call it it knows what it's on I wish I knew more about this. And I don't even know if it's necessary. Let me let me see if that works without all the binding syntax. This is good. All right, so it worked without the binding syntax. So let's keep it simple. Now we need to save it. Oh, we have a pattern for that. We solved that problem earlier with the with the header. Let's do that again. That worked pretty well. well. We'll create a form and we'll, where am I going to put the form? What happens if I put the form inside here? Mm, nothing good. Why do I have two titles? Oh, because of, it's because I, I put two titles, of course. And now page, what do we call the body? We're going to save it there. We'll call it body. Uh, we don't want editable. Let's, let's just get rid of that. I don't know what we're saving. I really don't know what we're doing just yet. What I do want to know is, is what happened to my form. So my form is still there. And so I could put that there. I feel, I feel like, I'm not sure I feel good. You know, I feel like this DOM element is kind of owned by the tip tap editor. It probably seems untrustworthy to put things inside it. So what I might do is we'll, we'll take that out for the moment. We will put the hidden field there. And we'll put our editor field there. I think that way, at least I know it will, will live even if you know, the editor is, is replacing this thing. So how about, how about we put that here? I know this is not how we wrote the class, but we'll fix the class. We'll fix the uh, controller to, to work with this. And, and I, I guess what we're doing is the same as we did for the other one, where the form was editable, then we had the input, so we had the hidden field. Let's make these look the same by putting that there. And then the you know the editable thing here. The, for us, we did it with content editable. Uh, sorry, for the header, we did it with content editable. And for this one, we're going to do it with the, the tip tap. So we now need to pass this information. So data, oops, data tip tap target equals content, whatever we want to call the target. And get rid of that. Okay, so now we need to rewrite our controller a little bit. So before we were mounting it on the controller, now we don't want to. I think we use the same target names, so that's convenient. I'll just Copy and paste those. So now we want this to be content target. Oh, I think. That did not work as well as I would have liked. That form. Mm -mm -mm. Ah, 
getting confused about rails versus this. inside these that we put it underscore, but in here we don't. Ooh, it's back. All right, so we've refactored our controller such that it now is attached to the form. We have an input, which we now need to update. And we have a, the empty DOM that I'm just gonna leave to tip tap, whatever it wants to do inside it, that's up to it. Okay, okay, okay. Now we wanna do the update. So we've got our update on update that will get called, borrowed with bounce. Now let's just borrow this thing. Cause you know, seems to do a pretty good job. Input, what are we gonna put in there? We're gonna put this. Yes. All right, look, I can, I can. Okay, 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 okay. Save this, please. Did it do it? Did it do it? I don't know. Probably better ways to find out whether it did it or not. We need a post. Come on. Nothing. It could probably still log update. Let's just check this is being called. Say this. Aha. Okie dokie. Value input target is nil. So now maybe I need that. There it works. So because I inside I here I wanted to access my control, right? I need that um, on update to be bound to the controller. And I think this is the syntax for that, such that when we pass the handle to the function around here, so we're sort of passing the object that is the function, that function is not detached from my controller, it's bound to it and it knows from whence it came. And it looks like it uh, is saved it there. Now what happened over here? Did I get, did I get a patch? So the patch, save this. Doo -doo. All right, looking very nice. Of course, the next time we refresh the page, it has this ridiculous content that we don't want anymore. Original content, no thank you. And we're gonna content this input target value. Let's give that a hot go. Oh, please. Do it. Yes. Yes. Look, if I refresh, it's there. It's different from this one. Oh, this is so, so exciting. So exciting. Not exciting is my cursor disappearing. So let's have a look what's going on and how we bring my cursor back. So when we do the form submission, it's... as a post and then what what can we see one uh, so we get home have a preserve log empty that two okay so where is my post How am I going to figure this out? Three. Okay, so we do a patch and then we return a redirect and then we go and get the page. And that is the problem. You know, even though it's inside Turbo Drive, we're, it's still effectively doing the whole redirect shenanigans, which worked perfectly. Renamed. So when we were renaming, it's like, that was great because then we get the new URL and everything updates and yeah, it could be nicer, but it was really simple. But when we're doing this, we, we don't want to re redirect the whole thing. We just wanted to do it in the background and kind of just ignore the outcome at the moment. So what do we got? Rails form remote. This, I think we want this thing. So. Remote elements, what have we got? So for the zone, we can pass local false. Okay, let's give that a red hot go. Where's my form? 
Here's my phone. Local boss. Oh, I still have a cursor. Still have a cursor. Everyone, everyone. I got a cursor. I got a cursor. I have a text editing, note taking thing. Look at us. I can. This is an item saved. I could I could do all sorts of things. I can Ruby JavaScript. This is probably is not really JavaScript at all, is it? It's just text. So what else? Oh, so exciting. Just But what's what's not exciting is this and this and this and this and this. Um, uh, sorry, what do I mean? What do I mean? So every time I, let's, let's do another one. Let's clear this. Every time I make a change, it looks like it's doing the post, which returns a, a redirect, which we don't care about because, you know, just save it. Leave my cursor where we left it. But then it goes and gets the contents. So and what does it get? It gets, oh! It gets the entire page, which we don't use and we just throw it away, but we don't definitely don't need it. We definitely don't need all of this. I mean, at best, I'm not even sure at best what we might need. I don't want any of this. So I guess our local true UGS thing. So uh, we were using this, you know, sorry. Uh, we're using a local false. It was using the UGS library. And maybe we don't need that. So, so I changed my mind. I changed my mind. So this was essentially what was switching out from Turbo Streams to the UGS library. And whilst it left our cursor in the right place, it did mean a lot of extra traffic coming out of my app to the browser, which we then threw away. So let's not do that. Let's just compare. Actually, I'll tell you what. Let's just do one thing. Uh, we have over here that this is the logs. So let's just see what the logs look like. Change. So here's the logs. And so when it came through, it was doing a patch or a post uh, put to this as JS, which then returned, I guess it defaulted to whatever the HTML was because we didn't specify a JS response. And then the UJS library was receiving that response and actually doing it, I guess. And instead, let's change that to not. Let's find out what this one does. So now to turbo. So you can see the see the down here. It still did the the three o. It still does the post or the. It's a post with a put overlaid on it. Anyway, we do the change, and it's still returning a redirect within the logs. No, 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 no. Oh, logs are the best. Here we go. That's the, that's the get. We can do this. Here it is. Here is the patch. Now it's a turbo stream. So local true, we get a JS um, and not local true is turbo stream. And either way, uh, let me have a look at, look at our controllers. Either way, we're not actually doing anything with turbo stream. So we could format turbo stream here. And let's clear this, I think. So there we still get, sure. Ah, oh, that's not correct, my bad. Let's put it down here. And now we get this 204, which is probably fine. More importantly, we don't, well, let's see what's in it. 204 kind of means no response or something. So no, no content. So header, so we did the post and we got a no content response. Don't know whether I care about that just yet, but let's just check this still works. And this does not work anymore. That's fine. That obviously makes sense. It makes sense because even though we have two forms, the title form and the body form, they are both going to this control action. They're both doing an update and they're both then saying, well, based on whether it was TurboStream 
or or HTML. I thought we changed. Oh no, we still. So here's what I think we'll do. This what I want to know. I think what we'll do is we'll say, you know what? Okay, one. I could have another action if changing the body. Don't go to the update action. Go to my change body action. I could do that. But what we'll do is we'll ask it a question. Say, hey, did you just change? So we'll say in the update action, did page changes? What changed? What changed? Now let's see what happens. Can we figure out? Oh, sorry, let me refresh that. And here. No changes. I'm very sure it changed on it. Where's that come from? Rails model changes. It's like the dirty library or something. Here we go. So maybe changes is only before we save. But what do we get anyway? If with this library, so this active model dirty library is added to our active record classes. So I get all this for free. But what do I actually get? So this is handy. I could do like body changed question mark. I'm currently but all oh, previous previously changed previous changes i wonder what that does Let's reset that make some more changes and boom look at us yeah 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 so you can sort of see that the body changed and not the title let's let's change this Down here, we see the title changed and not the body. Excellent. So well, what else, what are the other methods? Because I kind of just want to ask, hey, name previously changed, oh yeah. So let's do body previously changed. And title previously changed. Oh, and I think we want question marks. And reset the logs and go back here, v3. And down here so the body did not change and the title did excellent 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 and now we get something we haven't so now we get body changed body change and title didn't <laughs> is this a good idea I don't know. That's what I'm going with so I think what we'll do is if body changed, then that else, just do that one. And look at that, isn't that cool? I have VS Code. I would very much like to show you all the things I have installed in VS Code and be able to say, this feature comes from this extension. But I have no idea anymore. I, I like this, that linting, it doesn't tell you. It just says, you know, it tells you what to do. And I'm going to do it. I will do it, but right now I, I just want to bemoan my inability to tell you how I have VS Code set up. So let's move this out of here because it's in both parts of the if statement, it can be moved out and that was very helpful of the linter to tell me that. I, I probably, it's probably configured to use standard, like I use standard RB because that comes with Jumpstart and standard RB is also awesome. So I'm glad Jumpstart Pro uses standard RB. Standard RB is like, it takes Ro Rubocop and sort of says, well, let's, let's come up with a set of defaults that we like. And luckily I like them enough that we go with it. And the test double team that, that curate it do a great job of having good taste. Okay, so now if the body changed, then we'll do turbo stream, else, else. Oh no, we don't have to do that. It's just because it's basically, it'll just fail. We're sending us to turbo stream, so we'll accept that one and then all other types of requests won't be in here, won't know about the format.turbostream and will just fall back to the, uh, the HTML one, which is this redirect and which leads to all the behavior we didn't quite like. Okay, okay, so so now let's let's change the body. This should be turbostream. And down here, so here it was patch turbostream and no template because it came through that turbostream route. But if I change title we got the redirects with all the the benefits of doing a redirect because the url just changed and if we find our starting point 
here, where was it? Get, let's try again. There it is, patch comes through as a turbo stream, but because it wasn't a change to the body, it went, it fell through, it fell through, it never went in here, it never registered this response handler, therefore it just went to that fallback response handler, and we got the redirect, so. I think it's pretty handy. But what I don't like, actually, I tell you, uh, just between you and me, is I don't have, this is, I don't know how I feel about that. Y U 204. So what I mean by that is, is when I change this, I get this error. It kind of looks like an error. And I see no reason for that. Every time I look at it, I'm going, have I done something wrong? And the reason is because I guess I'm handling it, but I don't have a, an actual form. Like if I did that, it would actually complain, I think. There's like, well, you don't have an update.html. The TurboStream sort of quietly complains. How about we actually make one of those and see what happens? Like a blank one. Update.turbostream.erb. So let's leave it blank because I still don't need it to do anything, I think. What I'd just like it to be quiet. Okay now. And now my patch is less argumentative. So there it renders that blank template takes no time at all to do it, and we're back. The whole thing took 36 milliseconds, I mean, on my laptop, but you know, whatever. <laughs> Super M1 laptop. Unfortunately, you don't get those in production. Uh, but nonetheless, that was all very quick. And, and it's still turbo stream, so I, I mean, I'm not using any of the hooks, the before, after hooks, but you know, I can have a little spinner, some sort of save, I'm not gonna do that, but I could. I could, definitely could. Boom, excellent. Oh, I have one other idea. I have one other idea. Tidy up, tidy up, tidy up, tidy up. I was thinking of this, and so here is our controller. So, you know, in this controller, when the DOM loads and it finds that we're using the TipTac controller somewhere, which was wherever it is, right? So here we register the TipTac controllers. When the DOM loads, it connects a controller. When it finishes loading, we run the connect. And then we create an instance of this editor. The editor goes and creates a DOM objects. And but what happens when we go back and forth between pages? Does it does it automatically clean itself up? I I don't I don't, I'm not very really, I don't know. So we'll just do the right thing, um, and we'll try to clean it up somehow. Editor API destroy stops the edit instance and bind, unbinds. I, that, I think that, it's not just the fact that that thing's in place. You know, the, the editor adds all sorts of key bindings and things. So I guess, yeah, I think this is a good idea. We should do this. Um, so we have connect and essentially want to disconnect uh, this editor. That's what I want. And now I'll hide it somewhere else down here. So I think, I think we're better behaving. I mean, you know, it's not my browser, it's your browser, but I think this is a nicer thing to do. And whatever errors might've crept in because I wasn't cleaning up, they should never turn up now. Excellent. Well, we're done. Uh, it's finished. The whole project's finished. You could use it. You could, you, it's, you could, you, I could host this now and you could log in and get an account and start having pages and typing, it saves. There's an infinite number of other features that we could add, but this is done. This is, this is the weirdest, earliest, quickest V1 I've, I've ever had. Look, I, there's so many little things. Like down here, the, the text box is only here. Uh, yes, I can type and then now the bottom of the text box is here. But if I click down here, it doesn't do anything. Like I, I very much like this area down here to be clickable such that it put the cursor back into my editor, perhaps even added a row down the bottom. That, that might be nice. I click down here, it adds a row. Um, look, there's there's all so much. Tables, you know, how do we actually drop an image in? Because TipTab itself can render an image, but it has no method for saying, give me one. Um, of course, we would like to do it like tricks and uh, rich text where we have in Rails, where you, that image, any image that's uploaded gets stored in active storage, 
gets attached to the object and a, and a URL gets given back. We'd like that, I think. So many things, but ah, V1. Look, and collaborative editing. Very excited about that. Well, I really, since all that other stuff is just work, the collaborative editing is something I'd like to do in the next episode or two, just to try something that I wanted to see if it works the way I think it does, that two users can type and you see each other's work. That's gonna be awesome. And maybe com comments, other sorts of collaborative things. I think the collaborative aspect of a text editor, there's lots of text editors on the internet, but to have one that you can just drop in and get collaborative, I think is invaluable. And I think, you know, it's the Rails method of having CRUD forms is very you, just all about you. You press save, you create a record, it's just you, and only then can other people see it. This business of everyone typing at the same time, that's a feature that would be better if it was just easier. We could just add it to everything. I'd love to see someone, you know, their cursor up here changing the title. I'd like to know who they are and where they live, and where their children go to school, and I can have a stern word with them about touching my titles. But nonetheless, I'd like that feedback. So thanks for coming to the episode today. It's been a great one. And I won't commit to exactly what the next episode might be about, but we have a wide range of branching options. See you in the next episode.